Welcome everyone. And uh, this is the first talk in a series of uh, security related talks. And I'm going to talk about the keys to the kingdom because in many cases, these cryptographical keys are the things that secure our security systems and we love them because it's so easy to use them and, and it's it's kind of interesting that in the physical world we don't have such strong protections. I mean, if you build a safe, anyone can break through it given enough time and, uh, and effort. But with cryptography you can design such keys that uh, cannot be broken until the earth is swallowed by the sun turning into a red giant and stuff like that. Can we really? Sorry? Can we? Yes, we can. Uh, I mean, even with quantum uh, computers, uh, 256-byte uh, uh, AES keys are not really breakable because it's just such a huge number to, to brute force that doesn't really work. And uh, yeah, first of all, some warning. If you are a cryptographer, then please allow me to make some simplifications because we are not talking about crypto, we are talking about how to use crypto to abuse systems. And uh, it's, it's kind of hard because there are so many, uh, so many formats and encodings that many hackers just say that I, I can't work with this format. Uh, one system gives me A format, another system wants B format. I cannot convert between them and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I will mainly talk about RSA because that's what many people use. So uh, all the uh, certificates used on, uh, to secure TLS typically uses RSA. Cryptographic signing of executables also uses RSA, so I'm going to talk about that. But many of the things I will say will apply equally to other crypto systems like elliptic curves. So in RSA, this is just a recapping to get everyone to the same baseline. You have a public key, which consists of two numbers. Uh, one is called N. Uh, and typically called uh, modulus. And the one is E, which is the public exponent. And th this latter one is typically this uh, 10001 in hexadecimal, because it's really good to calculate with that. And uh, it, uh, it makes kleptography really hard. Do you know what kleptography means? It's the art where you try to generate, I mean, for example, let's look at an attacker who, who can supply you an RSA key generator. And he can do anything to backdoor that key generator, but he doesn't have any side channels. So he has to construct such a public key that can be later used as the single point of information to regenerate the private key, which should be not possible. And uh, if you choose such a small number, there is not many, not many bits of information to hide into. So this is one of the points of security of RSA. And then you have the private part, the D. And uh, well, it's just a convention. And typically, you do encryption by raising the message to a power of the public key. And if you raise that to the power of the private key, you get the original message back. And you can do it, of course, backwards, where you sign a message. So you create a value that anyone can uh, verify, but uh, no one can try to forge. And uh, this is textbook RSA. And this in itself is typically really insecure. So. If you ever wonder about creating uh, some kind of crypto application, don't do this. We have padding schemes to modify the message before actually applying these crypto primitives because that's how it works. And in OpenSSL, there is a really, really nice collection of tools to work with uh, crypto primitives. And I'm going to show you some examples to see that these are not magic black boxes you can drill down to how these things actually work. So 
if I say I want to generate keys, then I can say OpenSSL gen RSA and save the output into this private key file. And it says, yeah, he's generating an RSA private key and it has such a long module. This can be changed, of course. And here you have this value. This is the default value because it's a really good compromise uh, in performance and security. And if we take a look at it, we see that it has some, yeah, begin RSA private key, those bunch of gibberish numbers and letters and, and RSA private key. But what do these numbers mean? Well, uh, this is one of the possible representation of uh, RSA keys. And uh, you can use the RSA tool to try to decode it. You say that the input is this file, which contains the generate key. And then you can say no out to suppress any unnecessary output and say text to dump user readable information. And now it's much better. I will scroll back. So it prints that this is a private key and it's uh, 2048 bit long. Here's the modulus. And uh, if you look at it, it has like four and an eight, 12, 15 uh, bytes in a single uh, row. And it has five, 10, 15, and 17. So 17 rows of 15 characters plus two in the bottom. So it's 257 bytes. So you can multiply that by eight and you get that it's actually a bit more bits than it's advertised because if you look at it, there is a leading zero in the beginning. So now you know that the number of bits describe how long this modulus is. It also has this public exponent, which is the value we already know. And this private exponent part is, is what, what is actually the private thing. If anyone else knows this number, then your key is not really secure anymore because anyone can just use this information to try to reconstruct your key and steal everything. And it also stores some other information in the file so that it can do encryption more easily. These are not really relevant to our, uh, to our journey into cryptography. I'm just showing them that it's still in the file. And uh, OpenSSL has a really nice tool. And it's not many people know about it, called RSA Util, but without the I. And by design, it can do whoa, lots of things. So you can give an input and output data and uh, a key. And you can say you want to sign something, you want to verify something, encrypt and decrypt. Although you already know that, that signing and decryption is essentially the same thing mathematically, even though we, we feel that it's... It, uh, it's used for other things. And here is what I said about padding. So that before the actual encryption or decryption uh, takes place, you can use uh, special paddings. And this makes it possible that if I, for example, I, I will show you how I will uh, encrypt something with this tool and try to decrypt it but not apply the padding, then you can see the original padding because it will not be removed by the tool during the decryption. So to show something real, I will just say that the key is still this, uh, this RSA private key. And I'm going to say that I'm going to encrypt. Yeah, I wouldn't need the private key for that, obviously. And I will encrypt the word can. And I will apply some, well, for example, yeah, by default, it will use this kind of padding. So let's leave it at that. Yeah, and it's some gibberish. So let's put it into a file. And if you take a look at it, 
it's, it's exactly the same length as the modulus. And uh, it's, it, it doesn't have any recognizable structure in it. But if I put it as the input to this file, so I will just switch the parts and say that decrypted, we'll get the original thing back here. So we can see it works. And if I say that I, I don't want it to remove the padding by default, just use no padding, then uh, I will pipe it to HD, which is hex dump, because there will be some additional bytes which might not be readable. So this way we can see, well, yeah, we can see what came out. So you see, here's the plain text, the camp, and uh, all this other gibberish had been added to make certain attacks uh, a bit harder. So for example, if you as an attacker has some encrypted text and you have a hunch what the plain text may be, it would be trivial to just try to encrypt that plain text with the public key because you can do that and compare the outputs. But because of this random padding, it's simply not possible. It's not feasible to try to brute force all these random bits of information. So that's how this RSA util works. And yeah, of course, these other padding schemes also work. What's, what's a bit interesting about this is that cryptographers like to argue about which of these padding schemes is better. And the, the thing is that it's really funny to watch because all the time they come up with, with proof that none of them work essentially better than the others. So there is really no, no use trying to argue for one or the other. Just use some kind of padding scheme because otherwise you will have some serious problems. Okay, and uh, the next step is I have public and private keys. That's a really good thing, but I need to make some, I, I need to tie these to real world entities. And in this case, for example, in case of TLS, uh, for example, I, our homepage is uh, protected by TLS. If you visit it, your traffic is protected by TLS, but you need to authenticate the other party. So you use uh, certificates, which are essentially a form of a signed cryptogram that says that X says that the public key of Y is Z. So we have these three variables. And if we use cryptography, we can describe this information by having the Y is the, the letter Y depicts the, the person who this public key belongs to. So it's somehow we encode the name, for example, uh, in, on TLS, we use a, a standard called X400. I will show you in, in a moment how it looks like in real life. And you say that here's the info about the user, here's his or her public key. And now I sign this whole package so that if you trust X, you can verify that, that the information contained within, which is being who this public key belongs to, is not tampered with and valid. And in this case, we typically use RSA and for signing, we use some kind of hash function like SHA-1 or SHA-2 to reduce the size of the message because uh, the problem with RSA is, is that signing a message that is longer than the modulus is not possible. So, I mean directly. But of course, if you can shorten the message with such a hash function and sign the output of the hash function, then you get some nice results. Obviously, the problem here is that since you sign the output of the hash function, if someone can find another input of that to that hash function that gives the same results, then you have a serious problem because you only sign the output of the hashing function. So you need to be really sure that that hash hashing function cannot be abused in this way. And that is what happened with MD5, which was actually used by some malware. 
And uh, in SHA-1, we are getting there, although the current level of known attacks is still a bit far from here, but we already see the first cracks. And uh, in this case, uh, in X509, we use a standard called ASN1 to serialize all this information. Serialization means that I have some structured data and I want to store it or transmit on the network, so I need to get a bunch of bytes. And a serialization means just that, so you come up with some rules as how to, uh, how to use bytes to structure your data. And uh, in case of uh, OpenSSL, we have this really handy tool called X509, which can be used to, used to uh, look at these certificates. One way to create such a, such a certificate is using the OpenSSL rec tool. And I'll just answer the default to every question. And in the end, I'm going to have this really nice certificate, which also has these gibberish letters. We don't know what this means. And it says begin certificate and end certificate. It's really great. But now if I say open SSL X509 and whoa, yeah, that was the last thing I selected, and enter the file name and say again no out and text. Now I get interesting output. First of all, it has some serial number and this thing called issuer and subject. When these two things match, we, we call this self-signed certificate because there is no third party who vouches for the identity of the certificate. And, uh, but in most cases, uh, this is, these are the two things. You see, this is X says that the public key of Y is Z. In this case, X is the issuer and uh, Y is the subject. And you can also see the same modulus that we see that we've seen before here under this public key section. So and, and below here is the actual signature, which you can verify that this this uh, certificate was not uh, tempered with. But this is not the only format it can take. Sometimes we use the so called dare format, which is some, some, some people call it with other extensions, and we can use uh, X509 to convert between these, these different formats, and that's something that many people cannot comprehend, and it's really handy to know, so that you can specify both for the in and out parameters what the format is. And once you do this conversion, this will not be a text file, so I already open up it with the hex editor, you can see that it has some readable text. So it, it's, it's a binary format, and uh, it's essentially the same as the PEM one, but the PEM one has a base64 encoding on it, so that makes it easier to copy and paste into email clients and uh, web forms and things like that. But they, are, they essentially carry the exact same information. So for example, if I say, show me the first 10 lines, we use the head command, and I just try to do it by hand and try to base64 decode it, and then do the same thing with the dare file, and take the top three lines. You can see these are essentially the same three rows, so this is actually the same information in both files. It's just that the PEM is much easier to handle for humans, but it's really easy to convert between these two representations. The DARE format is the, is the more compact, and uh, actually there is a really nice image about this. Yeah. What the actual bytes means. So, yeah. I, you can see it, right? <laughs> yeah. Very nice image. Yeah, actually. And here below you can see it has uh, colored how the actual structure is described. So as I said, 
it has certain conventions like a sequence is just several objects after one another an integer is just you know a number and these prefixes can describe any kind of structured data the problem is that asn1 is so fucking complicated that this is why many browsers and other uh, code that interacts with asn1 objects has buffer overflow and other kinds of uh, bugs because it's such a convoluted and complex formats that it's really easy to have a buggy implementation and those bugs can sometimes lead to well security problems as well for example i'm not sure how many of you remember around five years ago there was a case when when a guy tried to put the zero byte into the the field uh, we call the common name which is essentially in this subject part you see this common name called b.com which says that this certificate is valid for b.com but, uh, but usually you can uh, you can get these certificates by vouching for the last part of the domain so he said something like yeah i should register a certificate for uh, asterisk then a zero byte and then my domain name well, it is before my domain name, so if I can verify that domain belongs to me, then I get the certificate. But most browsers are written in the language C, which uses zero as the string terminator. So when it parses that part, it says, okay, it's just an asterisk, which is a wildcard character. So this certificate is valid for every host. Uh, that's, it was really interesting. <laughs> and this is because this... Uh, ASN1 uh, uses a length-based string termination and not zero-based. So having a zero character, a zero byte within a string is perfectly legal for it. So yeah, it's a bit problematic. And uh, X509 makes a really good job at trying to, to show you a human-readable form of, of a certificate. But we have another tool in OpenSSL called ASN1Parse which says that uh, it's, it's actually a superset of, of X509 command because it can try to parse any kind of ASN1 structure. So not just certificates, but for example, public keys. So we can go back to our previously used files and say that uh, OpenSSL ASN1 dump parse. I always forget. And this has this little, nif little nifty com, uh, command line parameter called minus i, which says indent the structure. And now I just say I'm going to take first the certificate file, because we've already seen. So you see the same kind of information. So you have this serial number, but we see it as an integer. We see the, the hashing function used. We see all the parts of the subject, but this time it doesn't really have this nice human readable things. We just see sequence and integer and object and null. And in this part, it says where, where the offset is within the file, how long is that object and stuff like that. D is the depth, how deep I am, because you can, you can use this uh, ASN1 to describe infinitely nested structures. So this D says how deep you are within that tree of objects. And for example, in case of the key file, oh, yeah, with them, you can also see that, yes, this private key has the actual uh, integers which describe the public and private exponents. Here's the public exponent. So it's really easy to look inside these files if you have this ASN1 parse, especially if you receive it from some obscure system. So, for example, once I've seen a, a system that, that transmitted uh, the subject uh, encoded with ASN1. And just by looking at it, I didn't know what it meant, but with ASN1 parse, it printed this really nice uh, description of objects, and it was really handy to use that. And 
You can actually get these uh, certificates by using, for example, Wireshark. So when you are trying to reverse engineer an application and, and you want to see what kind of certificates go through the wire, you can use Wireshark. So the certificates are sent in a packet right after the server hello. So if we open up Fire, Wireshark, it's a really nice open source program to actually sniff network traffic. And I say I want to sniff this first Ethernet interface. And I say I'm going to limit my capture to TCP port 443, which is HTTPS. And then I say, for example, our homepage. Then I can see some packets. I'm not sure if you can read anything there. You can zoom. Ah, can I? I don't know. Um, right. Right. Right, 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 right. Oh, wow. I never believed it would work. That's what it was. Can you see that now? Yeah. Cool. So you have many kinds of packets here. I will scroll this right. So first of all, the client says that, hello, I'm a client. I want to open a secure connection to you. And then there we have a server hello that says, hi, I'm the server. I can do this and that. And then later, the server sends certificates. And in this case, it can mean uh, more than one certificate because the browser, uh, the web server has to prove to the browser that there exists a trust chain between uh, the certificate that is provided for that exact host name that the server uses and some certificate that is inside the trust store of the browser. And in this case, uh, we can see that, you see, you can also uh, use Wireshark to dissect this kind of uh, this kind of uh, X509 structures. You see that the issuer is Netlock, which is a Hungarian certificate authority, and the subject is our company. And then we have another thingy, which is called uh, an in intermediate certificate, which is used to uh, lower the risk of the issuer. But I can easily uh, save this by selecting the certificate row and say that I want to export the packet bytes. And in that case, it can write those into a file. So for example, in this case, I will say save uh, there because it uses the there format because it would be a waste to use the more lengthy base64 encoded format on the wire because it's not for human consumption. And now if I take a look at it with OpenSSL X509 and I use the inform there because it's in their format, I can see the same information. So that's how I can get the original uh, uh, certificate used for transmitting the stuff. And there are, people usually try to compare the so-called fingerprints. And how this is calculated is really easy, although some people treat it as uh, some kind of uh, black box. So you see here are fingerprints, the SHA-256 uh, and the SHA-1 fingerprints, and these are all calculated on the DARE encoded uh, versions. So for example, if I copy the SHA-256, uh, just here so that I can have it, and then try to perform the same one, for example, with the command line SHA-256 sum and give the save their version. I get the exact same bytes. It's only that it's uh, delimited by columns and this is not delimited, but you can see that it's the same value. So that's how you can actually make sure that you have the right certificate if you don't trust the PKI system and why would you? So that is how, how you can calculate this stuff. And uh, as I said, some people don't really trust this fake AI system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can understand that. You see uh, the certificate authority system depends on 
every certificate authority being able to sign any certificate for any party. And this leads to problematic situations where taking over a CA by a hostile team, for example, uh, in China, a Chinese CA being taken over by the Chinese authorities, they can issue actual certificates, for example, for gmail.com or any other name which is not used in China. I mean, they are not using Chinese uh, certificates, but the problem. So certificate pinning is, is uh, typically used to, as a hardening measure against that. And it's, uh, it's one of the things that make reverse engineering harder because in those cases, to inspect the traffic flowing between a client and the server, you have to delete this kind of uh, uh, functionality from the client in order to get access. And uh, there are several uh, approaches. Some people use the so-called certificate pinning, where you say that you can only use this certificate and nothing else. While you can also say that I have a key pinning, which is a bit different. You know the difference? What, what would be a practical difference between certificate and key pinning? Yes, the key uh, doesn't have to change between certificates. So, for example, if you use Let's Encrypt, you can use the same key for years, but have the certificate regenerated every three months. But if you'd use a certificate pinning, you'd have to reissue the pinning information every time. And it also has those uh, pesky catch-22 things that how can I inform the other party of my new certificate if he doesn't accept the certificate to transmit this information? Uh, yeah, it's problematic. And of course, in this case, you can also use a hash-based uh, approach, like this is the hash of my great certificate, you can only use this, or the real thing by that I mean, you can transmit your whole certificate and have it with your client. For example, if you look into Google Chrome browser, they have a separate list of Google certificates that can be used for certain Google services, so that uh, they cannot be circumvented by some Chinese certificate authority mistakenly issuing stuff. And uh, obviously, since uh, TLS works behind the scenes in the web browser, typically certificate pinning was used in uh, either like in Chrome inside the web browser core logic, or in thick client applications, like for example, the first one, do you know what was the first certificate pinning app in wide circulation? It was a Twitter app because they had some issues. So they, in their smartphone applications, they said that the application will contain the public key and the certificate so that it cannot be confused by any kind of man in the middle technology. And uh, later the web got his own version of of such a protection. It's called HPKP or HTTP uh, public key uh, pinning, yeah. So in this case, they said that it's going to be a key pinning because that makes it much easier, especially since uh, HPKP is a bit like HSTS in that regard that you have to give a long timeout for it to work so that if the user's browser has the information that this site asked for hardened measures, then it only makes sense if the user later revisits the site that it's within that timeout defined. And uh, in this case, they typically use the hash of the ASN1 encoded key. So for example, in case of this homepage, uh, I can open up the the developer tools and ask for a refresh. And in the response, I can, nope. Oh, still in the headers. In the response headers, there's this public key pins uh, line, which says that the, that the SHA-256 uh, version of the key must be this, or this other one. It's really important to have those uh, to have two different keys because if you lose your you lose your access to the single key inside this header, you just made your site uh, not working. You have self-dosed yourself, 
because your site won't work with any other key. So you have to have a backup key and you have this max age options that says how long it should work. And uh, it's really easy to verify this because all you have to do is, well, I will try with this, uh, with the first one first, because I know that that's the primary key, but of course we could try the same one with the second and it will obviously not work because that's the backup key. So I have this base64 encoded stuff. If I try to decode it, you see that it's uh, two lines of 16 bytes. So it is a SHA-256 uh, bits. And if I, I have the certificate in save dot there. So the only thing I have to do is, you know, this save there contains the certificate, but the pin is calculated on the key. So I need to extract the key and obviously you can use OpenSSL for that. You see, the problem with OpenSSL is that it can do anything, but because of this, it can be so complex sometimes, even though the manual tries to be helpful, although th there are certain things that could be improved. So I say I want to use this as an input and it's in their format. And uh, I want to say, I want to have the, mm, well, I'm not sure about the format, but we'll see, yeah. And because of this minus pub key, it outputted the public key for me. So right now I can say open SSL X, uh, sorry, RSA. And I want to output uh, their format. And I want to take the SHA-256 sum of it. And I will paste on the input this thingy. And now I got some SHA-256 thumb. And if I call back the base64 version, you can see that these are the exact same bytes in both versions. So this is correct. And uh, yeah, this, this is one way to calculate it, obviously. <laughs> but uh, I also developed a small tool that can help with such cases. And uh, it's called ktool and a uh, little Python script. And I, I, I created it because uh, OpenSSL still lacked many features and I don't want to re-implement OpenSSL. I just want to extend it. So it uses a, a, an SQLite database to store your keys because I found that during a reverse engineering assessment, I can have a collection of many keys and sometimes it's difficult to see, yeah, I find another key, which service does this belong to? And it's great to have a searchable database of all the keys you encounter during an engagement. And uh, it can import and export from this database and to this database. And of course it can calculate HPKP, which is something I will demonstrate it with. And the other thing it does is it can construct public key, uh, their encoded public keys from, uh, from, uh, uh, from the E and N parameters. So it's really handy tool. And now, for example, I can use the, the, uh, hmm. yeah, I, I will start from a clean version. So I will import it and use a comment field. So this is how I can tag actual keys, like in this case thingy. And if I list it, it will show this nice comment. And for example, if I want to export comment S2 and I say format HPKP, it will either crash or work. Why does it, uh, okay, this demo is officially not working. It worked before, I promise you. So, so uh, we have two more interesting formats left. The Java key store, uh, which is usually treated with some kind of holy respect, but only the Java people use it. Uh, 
and it has an arcane command line tool uh, called key tool and uh, it even has several different formats so the 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 specification allows for several providers to define their own formats and we have sun who defined one format the jks uh, and we have bouncy castle bks and latter is used by android because yeah, everybody knows about the legal problems with Oracle, and they didn't want to, to have another fight on this Java cryptography architecture stuff, so they used the Bouncy Castle implementation, which was not written by Sun, and uh, actually has some really serious problems. Uh, in the last, uh, last version of uh, the uh, Proof of Concept, or Get the Fuck Out, uh, the 15th uh, volume, there is a really good article about the security of it because, as it turns out, uh, it really, it, I mean, it's protected by a password, and that password is transformed into a key that is used to encrypt that key store. But even that is is used in a fashion that you can do more than eight billion trials per second on a single GPU. So it's. I wouldn't say it's a really good protection. I mean, there are good uh, uh, key derivation functions and they are not using one. So Java key store is uh, kind of manageable with key tool because, I mean, not my K tool, but key tool, the original Java one. I've prepared, uh, I prepared a, uh, the Android application, for example, which uses a bouncy castle key store in it. And if I say I want to extract this file, I will have here, if I say file this, it says data. Yeah, that's pretty really great. But you can see some strings in here. So the funny thing is that the certificates are not encrypted, only the private keys. So you already have some kind of info leak because of that. So in order to use that, you have the you have to invoke the key tool with uh, what kind of store type you want to use because it's not JKS but BKS. You have to provide a provider path. You have to provide what the class name of the provider is. So I I mean I'm. I can understand why people don't like this. <laughs> and uh, the only thing you have to use here is uh, right now, I don't want to import any certs. I just want to, uh, for example, have a list of certificates inside. And it asks for a password. And But if I just hit enter, it says that, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the integrity will not be verified, but you can still view the certificates because they are not encrypted. So many people assume that when something asks for a password, then it's protected. But uh, it's really nice to just hit enter and see what happens sometimes. And now you see it has some, some certificates and I can use to extract them by using alias this and export and RFC which results in this really great PEM format. So actually key tool can be used to convert to reasonable formats. It just have to be asked in a stern voice like, uh, like export and RFC. Although that RFC in itself is really interesting choice of identifier, but it's their problem. So you can use key tool and now from the video, you'll have this real lengthy uh, path that you can use. Although I'm, I'm thinking about integrating it into a, a K tool so that it would be a little bit, little bit easier. And we also have another beast. It's uh, the uh, PKCS12. Uh, it's also a binary format to store uh, private keys and certificates. And it's really complex. Uh, Maybe some light will be shed on it if I say that it was invented by Microsoft. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually. <laughs> so if you look at it, I, I have one for... Uh, 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 
I'm not sure if any one of these is... Nope. Uh, I thought I had an image of it, but, well... Yeah, I only had one for the Java, because it's... Yeah, it's horrible. But I don't have one for this format. So, this is sometimes used in applications, and it, it, the great thing about it is that it supports multiple key derivation functions. So, it can be weak or it can be strong, and it all depends on the little uh, variables you set it by when you create it. And you can use the OpenSL uh, PKCS to open and create such files. So, for example, uh, well, um, why doesn't it work? I think I had it in my history, but now I'm starting to feel like I might be missing something. Yeah. Yeah, so this minus export is what I was looking for, but it uh, turns out I used it at the end. So with this command, I can actually turn the private part and the certificate part into a single file. So it will contain my private key and also a certificate that can identify myself to other parties who agree with the issuer of that uh, certificate. And it asks for a password. And uh, for example, if I say foo, and uh, if you look at the resulting file, it doesn't really have that kind of plain text in it that you could uh, get from it. So it protects the public keys a bit better and the certificates. And obviously, you can use this with this info. Uh, yeah, the info is at the end. You can use the info to get information, but if I don't enter the password, it will just say that Mac verify error. So I have to actually enter foo to have it uh, print all this stuff. And even after that, it will ask for a passphrase to encrypt the key to export it, but we can just skip that right now. So this is a bit more protected, and you can also just extract it uh, like this and uh, use a GPU to crack it if it's crackable, but usually the password is there in the executable because it has to read it some way from the file system. So usually it's just a matter of reverse engineering. Uh, and that's about what I wanted to share with you about these cryptographic adventures I went through because every time I found myself googling for Stack Overflow posts to convert from one format to another and now we and and some conversions are not even feasible so I've written K tool because for example there is no no uh, ready-made construction to convert for example a string of hex bytes as as a modulus uh, to a PAM file or in the other direction, it's a bit easier because you just have to copy paste it. But people said that, yes, you should write an ASN1 file and then compile it. And it's just horrible. So I hope that this K tool can be built into a community project that can convert anything to anything else. And uh, it's, it's because it's written out of frustration. So. The features that work now actually work because I, I had that problem during reverse engineering assessments. And uh, I hope it will help uh, some of you. And uh, I even hope that you can contribute back to it. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Uh, did you find a way to export the private key with Java key tool? Or is there any? I remember needing it and it didn't work. I had to extend it. Uh, I, I know that it can be imported. Uh, yeah, you can export it. Okay. With a little detour. Uh, you can export. Uh, uh, you see, uh, key tool. Blah. 
why is it so slow? Ah, it's Java. Uh, so, so it says there is one that says uh, blah 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 blah. I mean, it's an obvious function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not seeing the exact command. May maybe they just hidden, but you can. Uh, the key tool cannot uh, not only can handle uh, Java key stores, but it treats pkcs12 as a key store as well. So you can export it into pkcs12, and then you can use OpenSSL to get the private key out of the pkcs12. So that that's the little detour. So you can do it, but that's, that's my main frustration with key tool. When something crashes and you need the private key for recovering some stuff and you have to look it up. Yeah, that, I, I know only of that way. But of course, if, if uh, K2 could, would have a Java-free implementation of the format, that would actually help with this. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah? What's your experience with encrypting and decrypting with different tools? So if you are encryptified with OpenSSL, did you succeed to decrypt with another tool? I, I, I never had any problems with that. I mean, these are really simple crypto primitives. So usually my biggest uh, time hogs are me not configuring it properly. Like, for example, in case of symmetric encryption, I usually uh, leave the encrypt decrypt flag in the wrong way. And it obviously doesn't work. Well, except for stream ciphers, but <laughs> obviously. Uh, no, OpenSSL actually works quite great. There were even situations where the built-in uh, cryptographic libraries of programming languages worked worse than invoking OpenSSL as a subprocess, which was really embarrassing. Uh, but it at least worked, uh, as opposed to, for example, Python. Python is a great language for lots of things. Its cryptographic libraries are horrible. And I mean it. All of them. I mean... Sodium rules. <laughs> yeah, sodium, sure. Uh, but, but then there is the other 99% of the world. And as a reverse engineer, I have to deal with people using RSA. Sorry? The messages are not all so There's at least one that is not. That was not. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, yeah. After how many hours of frustration did you start this project? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard because you, you could measure it as the amount of, of the summary of small frustrations. I mean, for example, I did that ASN1 compilation part once because I was curious. Yeah, that's, that's always a good, good excuse later. I was curious. But... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it, it, the last time when I first started writing it, uh, it's about after one hour, and I said, "Yo, oh, no, no, never." Because, uh, for example, in that case, the the application had several different key sets for production, testing, UAT, integration testing, and I was like, "I will not reverse engineer which one is picked. Just import it into a database, and then I will see in Wireshark what." Uh, which certificate is used, and gee, please just let me look it up in a database. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's something that no tool ever offered me to perform. But this was a new problem, because previously it was always the same keys. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Okay. Then, uh, the next talk is going to be about uh, the link to the hash or something like that. And uh, I think we should have a 10 minutes break before that. Thank you. Thank you.